Hello, thank you for joining us today for our discussion on stopping the spread of online mis- and disinformation. As we head into the 2022 midterm elections, the proliferation of false information is a rising challenge to democratic institutions. In recent months, the January 6th committee has spotlighted the role of online platforms in harboring false information leading up to the attack on the US Capitol, but I should add that this challenge is not only domestic, but also global. By way of introduction, I'm Caitlin Chin, a fellow at CSIS, and I'm thrilled to welcome this fantastic group of researchers who are at the forefront of studying how false information campaigns spread online and what platforms and governments can do about it. But before we get started, I'd like to turn the virtual microphone over to my colleague, Suzanne Spaulding. Suzanne is a senior advisor and director of the Defending Democratic Institutions Project at CSIS, and her career in public service spans DHS, the CIA, and House and Senate Intelligence Committees. Suzanne has led research projects on election security and state-sponsored disinformation campaigns and has very generously agreed to start us off with a few remarks on the current outlook for disinformation and its national security implications. Suzanne, the floor is yours. Great, Caitlin, thanks so much. It's such a pleasure uh, to be part of this uh, program and, and with this very impressive group. Um, I, you know, I, I will start um, just by noting something that I'm, I know you are all aware of, which is the title is a bit ambitious, right? Stopping the spread uh, of mis and disinformation. Um, we know that's not really uh, possible, that like so many other things, this is an exercise in risk management and not risk elimination. Uh, and I think that's really important, not just for managing expectations, but because it has very real implications for the kinds of policies that we uh, pursue to address this threat. And I'll come back to the implications of that. You know, I first started getting involved really uh, in uh, disinformation and misinformation, what we now call mis dis and mal information, um, back in 2017, really in 2016, when I was still at, at the Department of Homeland Security as the Undersecretary, um, where I had the honor of leading the men and women who worried every day about protecting the security and resilience of our nation's critical infrastructure, including our election infrastructure. And of course, we had uh, all of the uh, information operations around the 2016 election. And when I got out in 2017, um, I, I, I got out with the knowledge that what we had seen in 2016 around the elections was really just a small part of an, a long-term broad campaign uh, by Russia to undermine democracy and the public's trust in democracy and democratic institutions. And we convened, I convened a group of bipartisan national security experts at CSIS um, uh, with uh, Dr. Hamry to talk about our, the threats to our national security and our democracy from what we now call MDM. We issued a report in 2018 on countering adversary threats to democratic institutions. And of course, we called for a national strategy to prevent, deter, and reduce the impact of these information operations. And I recently had an opportunity to go back and reread it and um, the recommendations are as relevant today, I think, and obviously, uh, while our focus was on Russian and other adversary information operations, um, the recommendations are really as relevant to domestic sources of disinformation. And, um, and just to quote uh, a, a little bit from that, um, put simply, uh, the group concluded, internet platforms and democratic governments must work together on technological and policy measures to increase barriers to entry for disinformation campaigns and make it easier for citizens to differentiate between legitimate and false information. Sounds like uh, fairly obvious steps, but ones that have been uh, really difficult uh, to implement. The platforms have made significant efforts, but there is clearly more they can and should do. Uh, we had this recent revelation of the audit of Twitter's efforts, the audit that was undertaken by the Althea Group, founded and led by Lisa Kaplan, um, that found that that platform was grossly, is grossly under-resourced for the responsibility that it has as a very influential element of political and policy discourse uh, all around the world. 
Google and Facebook are a much better resource, but they are still uh, carrying far too much disinformation. And, and we continue to see problems like the Google placed ads on Russian propaganda sites. And as Renee has noted, and I'm sure she'll talk about, unmoderated platforms like Telegram may be the most problematic, and yet they get the least attention. So I'm sure your speakers today, Caitlin, your conversation will, will address this. But one of the things that we noted was that whatever technical measures uh, are undertaken, they must be accompanied by a campaign to help Americans understand why they should care, right? Why is this important? Um, we, we need to do a few things, I think. I, I think we still need to work on making the stigma of spreading false information more uh, meaningful than the status of being the first to share. Uh, but I think we also need to promote a greater understanding of how disinformation harms our nation, including our national security. Um, as you know, we did a, undertook about a year and a half of programming around uh, countering disinformation uh, through civics as a national security imperative. And I'll come back to that. Uh, you know, I think it starts by understanding the ways in which disinformation is so detrimental to us. Obviously, it exacerbates divisions, ma uh, makes our sense of shared grievance stronger than our sense of shared values and aspirations, right? So we talk about how there's nothing we can, can't do if we come together with a common purpose. Well, the corollary is that if we can't come together, we will almost certainly fail to meet the challenges that we face. So this divisiveness is really uh, debilitating for our uh, ability to meet the challenges. This, the lack of faith that it exacerbates uh, in our institutions. We address this in, uh, in one particular area, and that is that we did a deep dive on um, particularly, again, Russia's efforts to undermine public trust in our justice system and wrote a report beyond the ballot, uh, which talked about a concerted effort to uh, undermine the public's trust in the independence and impartiality and competency of our court system and using all three channels that 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 Russia uses official statements um, from from uh, Russian officials and and their open propaganda outlets like RT and Sputnik, as well as social media. And I think we saw some of the implications of this, frankly, on January 6th, when in the face of over 60 cases that had rejected uh, allegations of wide scale fraud in the election, a significant number of people continued to believe that there was wide scale fraud to reject the legitimacy of those court decisions uh, to view them as political. Uh, and ultimately, this lack of faith in our democracy and our democratic process does lead to violence. And that's the concern, right? If you think that you have no other option, if you, if you don't believe in the ability of democratic processes and constitutional means to achieve change, you're going to resort to violence. And we see that in very alarming surveys. I'm very concerned about the upcoming elections. I think the pump is primed, frankly, on both sides for folks to reject the legitimacy of the election. Uh, and it's not clear that the courts have the legitimacy to resolve these disputes and ensure the peaceful transition of power in the midterms and in those congressional races, as well as in 24. And of course, we know our adversaries, especially Putin, have every incentive and almost no disincentive to muck around and exacerbate that mistrust in the legitimacy of that process, to sow chaos and mistrust. So we need to be hyper vigilant, and we need to share what we know uh, with the public as quickly as we can. And we should be thinking about all the ways we can pre-bunk as much as possible uh, in anticipation of that. I worry that we, we have um, recognized the danger of domestic sources of disinformation, but that we uh, we, we best not take our eyes off our adversaries' uh, threats as well. Um, it's, it, what we concluded in that 2017 report is that reinvigorating our shared narrative is a, is a generational imperative. It requires the democratic institutions live up to their responsibilities as pillars of democracy and the engagement of educators, parents, elected officials, civil society, and at a basic level, every American citizen. We ultimately concluded that the best way, most sustainable way to counter uh, the impact of disinformation 
is to build public resilience against the content of that disinformation. If you accept, as, as I said at the outset, that you are never going to stop disinformation, then you've got to, as part of your um, uh, ways of countering that, you've got to build public resilience against that uh, disinformation. And we ultimately concluded that the best way to do that, given what we see as the most pernicious impacts of disinformation, is to teach civics, is to reinvigorate civics. Um, uh, to reinvigorate that shared narrative, that shared sense of values, to, to build a stronger sense of national identity. And there's bipartisan support for civics as, a, as the best way to do that. To teach people about how our government works and how they as individuals can and must hold those institutions accountable and become more effective agents of change through constitutional means. This is why we say civics is a national security imperative. And because it's an imperative, it's so urgent. We have to invest in K through 12, but we can't wait for that long-term investment to pay off. We have generations of adults that have been ill-served by our education system. We have failed to adequately teach civics for decades. So we need to reach adults. Uh, and we recently launched a program called Civics at Work, which is designed to reach adults at their workplace and the idea is that business leaders will sign up and we've got some key business leaders already, Brad Smith of Microsoft, Tom Fanning of Southern Company and others, um, and agree to do three things, to be advocates for civics, reinvigorating civics education in this country, to have civics conversations with their workforce, and to support civics activities in their communities. Um, I think we have to take all of the approaches that I know your panelists will discuss uh, in dealing with a very urgent threat. But, uh, but again, I think uh, trying to understand the effects our adversary are trying to achieve and looking at the best ways to, to mitigate the likelihood of that success are what's really ultimately important. Thank you so much, Suzanne, for framing this issue for us. It really strikes me that tackling disinformation is a problem that goes beyond just the large tech platforms, but that requires a holistic approach that requires public education and civics. And I'm really looking forward to touching upon many of the themes that you've highlighted in your opening remarks, including the consequences of false information, the loss of public trust and even physical harm, and what that means ultimately for the democratic process and national security going forward. Like you said, this is a very nuanced and ambitious challenge to tackle, but we're very fortunate to be joined today by three panelists um, who are experts in myths and disinformation. Samantha Bradshaw is an assistant professor in new technology and security at the School of International Service at American University. Samantha's research centers around the political and social effects of technology and disinformation, as well as the causes and political frameworks that underlie this phenomenon. Renee DiResta is the technical research manager at the Stanford Internet Observatory. Renee has investigated and testified about Russian influence campaigns in the US political process and the role of online platforms in their circulation. And finally, Caitlin Bogus is the Deputy Director of the Free Expression Project at the Center for Democracy and Technology. At CDT, Caitlin's work examines platform accountability and transparency, as well as policy frameworks and considerations around content moderation and free expression. One housekeeping item, we encourage audience questions, so please go ahead and submit yours through our event page on CSIS.org, and we'll try to get to as many as time allows. I'd like to first start off by asking our panelists to frame the problem for us, and perhaps I can ask Renee to kick us off and then pass the mic to Samantha and Caitlin. Renee, what trends related to online disinformation have you been seeing in your research? Has there been an inflection point or a series of events that has forced the world to realize that this is a problem that we can no longer ignore? So uh, thanks for having me here. Um, I think I'd like to start by agreeing in large part with, uh, with Suzanne's comments that stopping mis and disinformation is unrealistic. And that's in large part because the problems that we face are not new. Uh, mis and disinformation has always existed. It's just that it manifests differently today. 
And the information environment has significantly increased the global public's access to tools required to create and disseminate content, to target audiences, to grow movements. And so that's had some pretty profoundly positive effects. Um, but at the same time, it also enables the misuse by what we sometimes call malign actors who use the same system and, uh, and operate very much deliberately with the intent to influence and deceive uh, their targets. So the tools are the same, whether they're used domestically or for outward facing state propaganda campaigns. And over the last seven years, since this, the recognition of the modern manifestation of the problem um, really took shape, we still haven't hit a point where we've been able to successfully establish norms or define harms. Um, since 2018, we've had a conceptualization of coordinated inauthentic behavior, that's Facebook's term for it, um, that has focused a lot of platform attention on takedowns that are really related to the authenticity of the speaker. And so now we see regularly with a kind of recurring cadence, even most recently, um, some accounts that were being operated um, that appeared to be operated from within the United States. You know, we've seen some really interesting dynamics um, kind of come out recently, but I would say these sort of state actor campaigns, um, mercenary run campaigns, we see seven or eight of them come down on average every time the platforms put out these, um, these assessments, these announcements of what they've taken down. Um, one of the challenges that we have here, I think this also echoes what Suzanne said, is that a lot of what we're seeing, a lot of the stuff that actually has impact within the targeted population is stuff that really manifests more as rumors and propaganda. Um, so not so much misinformation, which implies there's something falsifiable, or disinformation, which has this connotation of a campaign, um, but the virality of rumors and propaganda, which really reflect the offline reality of a low trust society, a high polarization environment, and particularly within the US, but we see this elsewhere as well, um, this feedback loop that's happening between what is taking shape online, what is going viral online, and then the echoes of the, uh, of the kind of political environment underpinning the, you know, what the campaign is focused on. Um, one of the things that we really see quite regularly now is even as we have this conceptualization of coordinated and authentic behavior, even as the public recognizes the presence of malign actors, of state actors in particular, at the same time, there is a significant blowback against platform content moderation. Really, that conversation has changed quite a lot uh, because what particularly during COVID, what seemed like heavy handed moderation approaches have increased anger about censorship. Um, which has resulted in the perception that any type of moderation, even something like labeling, which is you know, contextualization or a counter speech, uh, is now being perceived as kind of overly heavy handed platform responses. Uh, this, of course, is fantastic for adversarial actors who simply kind of pile on and make the argument that um, that whenever a platform changes a policy or creates a moderation moment, um, it is, you know, it, it is uh, egregious to kind of to take their accounts down. I would say the one other thing, just to add one final thought, um, is we see almost a kind of regulatory arbitrage around content moderation at this point, where uh, state actor networks and things that would ordinarily have tried to achieve a foothold on Western platforms like Facebook and Twitter, because those platforms have imposed a cost, because they take down the networks and they are not able to grow large followings, we see them instead taking shape on largely unmoderated platforms. Uh, so alt platforms, regional niche platforms, or even uh, communities like Telegram, where they are not going to try to make an assessment, they are not going to try to argue that this is a Russian state actor or not, uh, the content is simply out there and whoever consumes it, consumes it. And so we see a lot more of this uh, momentum, this move to um, to unmoderated and undermoderated platforms uh, by state actors. And so a combination of that, leveraging influencers, you know, they're just running campaigns differently than they were before, but they're still in the mix. Um, I would just add to Renee's comments that uh, one thing we've been noting at CDT is that a lot of the research being done on mis and disinformation online is being done on some of the bigger platforms like Facebook and Twitter. Um, and that is in part because those platforms are relatively easier to study than maybe some other types of platforms, um, especially things if it comes to perhaps um, end-to-end encrypted messages services or platforms like that where we know disinformation can also be spread 
Well, it's a lot easier for researchers to get access to public tweets than it is to get access to somebody's private messages in order to understand how disinformation is spreading on a private messaging service. But at the same time, um, it's important to look at the context, uh, different cultural contexts and things like that when you think about the spread of disinformation globally, because we know that some platforms, uh, private messaging platforms are highly influential in different countries. So for example, CDT published a research report that looked at disinformation uh, in the United States, Brazil, and France related to elections. And one interesting aspect of disinformation in Brazil that we found is that because WhatsApp is such a dominant social media platform in that country, that that's a very important focal point for the spread of disinformation um, in Brazil as well. And then finally, I would just also say that even as we're working to combat the spread of disinformation online, we still have to contend with the spread of disinformation in traditional formats as well, including through the news media, including through things like even robocalls. That's still a thing. In the last elections in the United States in 2020, there were documented instances of disinformation being spread through robocalls, telling people to stay home and not go out to vote because it was too dangerous because of COVID, or telling people that they could vote the next day after an election um, to avoid long lines and other false information like that. So it really is a multifaceted problem that we're confronting across all types of technology these days. Yeah, I can jump in here too. I think those are all really excellent points. Um, and I think as researchers um, with disinformation and the ways that these challenges manifest differently in the digital era, we're, we still have a lot of blind spots um, across different kinds of apps, um, but also different kinds of communities and how people might experience disinformation differently depending on who they are. Um, and I think this kind of echoes um, some of the points going back to uh, what we're was saying about how um, it's not these falsifiable statements that are the things that tend to go viral. Um, it's propaganda and it's propaganda that tends to be based on things like identity. So racism, sexism, misogyny, xenophobia. These are the kinds of narratives that gain traction among audiences on social media. They're the things that tend to go viral um, and they can have disproportionate impacts on users um, and on marginalized groups who might be members of these certain kinds of communities. Um, it can also serve to fuel polarization. And these are strategies that we see being adopted both overtly and covertly. If you look at Russian state back media coverage of the Black Lives Matter movement, um, we can see like distinct audiences being targeted by different kinds of outlets where, you know, RT and Sputnik um, are pushing more conservative um, narratives and more, I should say, more narratives um, that appeal to people on the right of the political spectrum that are much more um, Blue Lives Matter um, and a, a bunch of outlets. Um, that are kind of, you know, new, um, speaking to uh, uh, audiences on the left of the political spectrum, pushing more of the, the pro Black Lives Matter content. And these kinds of identity based propaganda are really used to drive that polarization and foment that ongoing distrust and um, that inability for us to come together as citizens to make democracy work. So from what I'm hearing, disinformation can be decentralized and that adds to the challenge. It comes in many forms over platforms like WhatsApp, which Caitlin mentioned, or Telegram, which Renee mentioned. Um, we also talked about news media, influencers, robocalls. But how do the origins or the sources of disinformation affect our framing of the problem? In other words, what are some causes, common causes or motives behind the false messages that we've been seeing, for example, related to voter suppression or Blue Lives Matter? And in your research, have you seen any evidence that these coordinated campaigns have achieved their attended, intended goals? So I would say around um, sources of disinformation, one thing that our research has shown is that it's extremely um, impactful in a negative way when government officials or candidates are the source of disinformation. And so I know we've talked a bit about kind of foreign influence campaigns, but domestic disinformation can be really harmful as well. And that's especially true when it's being 
actually spread by a politician or somebody who's in office because those people are influential because they have a large number of followers that can really make something uh, go viral very quickly and get picked up on by their followers and then replicated and spread so of course we have the example in the united states of um President Trump and his false claims about mail-in voting before the last election, which became a very dominant uh, narrative of disinformation uh, during that election. In Brazil, similarly, President Bolsonaro spread false information about the reliability of electronic voting machines in that country. And so just having these people that are um, kind of at the head of government are supposed to be leading um, and setting an example. Spreading disinformation is really problematic and uh, and causes disinformation to spread even further. And then the other trend we've noticed is um, the combination of disinformation with violent threats as well, unfortunately. So the most obvious example, of course, is the January 6th riot in the United States, which was fed by the disinformation campaign around Stop the Steal. But there have been other examples too. Um, the Sharpie Gate campaign in the United States, which was a disinformation campaign and narrative that claimed that ballots in the 2020 election that were marked with a Sharpie could not be counted by the ballot scanners, which was not true. Um, and then there was a further disinformation uh, campaign and claim that conservative voters were purposely being given Sharpies so that they their votes would not be counted, which again was not true. But this went viral on social media and it led to protests, including a protest outside of an Arizona um, elections office where supporters um, brought signs, but also guns, and there were threats of violence. And so that's a really concerning trend we're seeing around the combination of disinformation and violent threats. Yeah, I'd like to add on to that as well when we're thinking about the implications of this. Um, if we're thinking about, um, again, kind of like minority um, communities or the effect that it can have on individuals, um, on women, uh, we know that state-backed disinformation campaigns targeting uh, female politicians, journalists, um, activists can have a very strong silencing effect. Um, there's been some research done um, that shows that, you know, people who have been targeted by these kinds of harassment campaigns, they tend to post less, they share less, they engage less on social media. And so it can really act as a silencing force um, against them and their ability to participate in democracy. So to kind of bring, you know, the two, the violence and the politicians together, the way that, you know, disinformation narratives can target certain kinds of people and groups, I think is a really, really important impact on the individual level. And all of this attention to online disinformation, of course, puts technology platforms in the hot seat, especially social media companies. Renee mentioned that some tech platforms have taken action, such as labeling false content to shore up their content moderation practices. But is this effective? What other actions have we seen tech platforms take to combat the spread of Miss or disinformation and what were those outcomes? That's a great question. So I think the platforms are doing a lot of work on the coordinated and authentic behavior um, dynamics. And that's something that is very, uh, I think that they've done actually quite a good job on it. Um, I'll you know give credit where credit's due in the sense that while there are always more to take down, we very rarely see the kind of follower count growth that we saw from the sort of um, canonical internet research agency effort where they had, you know, 133 Instagram accounts, some of which had upwards of 500,000 followers. So we've not seen any coordinated and authentic, and coordinated, excuse me, and authentic behavior hit that point. Um, but as others have noted, you know, there is this real challenge as the platforms try to wrangle and reconcile the tension between free expression and harassment or free expression and threats to election officials. Um, that's where I think some of our, you know, the, the only real signal that we have comes from whistleblower documents. And I think that's actually a really big problem. So my critique is almost more of a meta critique, which is uh, even as they wrestle with these things and, and try to determine, you know, whoops, did our recommendation engines push people into this toxic community? Or has this community hit a point where the rhetoric within it justifies a takedown because, again, in the lead up to January 6th, because they started to see calls to hang election officials and things along those lines. Um, that's where, you, you know, we, we discover these things after the fact. Right now, we have a perception that's largely shaped by um, 
here is a gap in which moderation, you know, policy, uh, sorry, where in which the enforcement of a policy did not appear to be congruent with the policy. And we see these things reflected in media coverage, the sort of something is wrong on Facebook, this should not be there. This manifests across the entire information ecosystem. But we have very little visibility into the holistic dynamics. And since content moves from one platform to another, and when a user is deplatformed in one place, they usually pop up somewhere else. I think that our capacity to do research in this space as outsiders is limited in large part because uh, access has been very much a self-regulatory effort in which certain platforms, I think as Caitlin noted, certain platforms give better access uh, than other platforms do. And, and that kind of foundational need for transparency and some kind of system by which we can interrogate these dynamics, assess, you know, is this overly heavy handed censorship, or in fact, were there terrible things in that group, you know, the, the ability to, to look on that from outside, I think it actually in the, at this point would benefit the platforms as well, because public sentiment finds their enforcement so illegitimate at this point. Yeah, I 100% agree with that. And, you know, I think one of the big gaps, too, in a lot of the data that gets made available to researchers is once accounts and content have come down, um, it's hard to get access to those groups and to understand what kind of impact they actually had. So retroact retroactively looking at um, accounts that have been deplatformed, who did they reach with what kind of messages, how much engagement were they getting, it's really hard for us as scholars and researchers to measure that impact because once the data gets taken down by um, the big platforms, um, it becomes non-accessible to us. I think another big challenge here too is that, you know, platforms have introduced a range of these measures to remove harmful content, whether that be, um, you know, taking and removing entire accounts or pieces of information off their platforms to maybe leaving it up, but demoting it or downgrading it in the algorithm so less people say it, um, to labeling and doing that kind of um, counter speech um, and providing con context to what people are seeing online. Um, one thing that we don't have very much insight into is how, um, how, consistent a lot of the platforms are when it comes to these practices. And um, in some of the research that um, I did with uh, Stanford Internet Observatory with some colleagues there, um, you know, we were looking to see, um, did Facebook and Twitter label content um, if consistently across their platform. So once something was reported to them as being potentially harmful or misleading, did all of those URLs or all of those posts get labeled consistently? The answer was like mostly um, about 70% of the content was labeled consistently. Um, but what this study showed um, was that um, content that wasn't being labeled might have been um, you know, as a result of things like um, their potentially their their algorithms. Um, so, for example, if an image was cropped differently, um, the algorithms that an AI um, that scans the content to identify other pieces of content that are similar might not have been able to detect that um, change. And so that was like one of the reasons why we saw inconsistent labeling practices. Um, others, maybe it had to do with a time lag. So things weren't backdated. If a URL was shared uh, between, you know, the first and the 10th and it was reported on the fifth, things from the fifth and onward were labeled. But all of that other kind of those posts that were uh, posted pre the fifth, they weren't labeled. Um, and so having insight as well into the back end of, you know, our platforms actually executing their policies consistently, I think is really important because it also feeds into some of these questions of trust, um, especially since there's such a dearth of trust right now in what the platforms are doing to handle this problem. Um, and so sharing more of this data with researchers um, and making it much more accessible to the public, I think, like like Renee said, is going to do the platforms a big favor here. Yeah, I agree with Renee and Samantha that it's um, it's really been difficult to assess the efficacy of platform interventions when it comes to disinformation because researchers so often lack access to the data that they need to do that kind of work. Um, it's amazing that researchers like Renee and Samantha have been able to do the research they've done with the limited amounts of data that's available. And if more access could be 
granted, um, more, even more research could be done to understand what are the real impacts of disinformation and are the interventions that platforms are engaging in actually effective or not. And Renee mentioned that thus far, all of the uh, data access has been a voluntary effort by platforms. And so I just wanted to mention that um, in Europe, the recently passed Digital Services Act, uh, which is a comprehensive regulation of online services, actually includes a provision known as Article 31 that will be a requirement that very large online platforms turn over certain types of data to independent researchers so they can conduct research and assessments about risks um, with how platforms are operating. And so that will be a uh, game changer, I think, when it comes to researcher access to data. There are a lot of details, though, that still have to be sorted out and will be sorted out as the delegated acts for the DSA are put into place. Things like how are researchers actually going to be given this data? What are the restrictions going to be on what, what they can do with it once they have access? And, and how uh, user privacy will be protected even while we give more access to researchers. But nevertheless, I think researchers um, in Europe certainly will take advantage of that and potentially researchers around the world too. And in the US, there have been various proposals in Congress that would require platforms similarly to turn over certain data to researchers. Uh, none of those bills have passed yet, but there's more and more momentum around them. There are more and more bills being proposed, things like the Platform Accountability and Transparency Act or the Digital Services Oversight and Safety Act. Um, some of the bills are targeted around ad transparency, which is, which is a whole other category where disinformation also flourishes that we haven't even talked about. So there is a real movement and momentum, I think, around giving researchers greater access to data, um, which I think is really important. And two areas where I think more transparency is especially needed um, are around uh, algorithmic amplification of content. Renee mentioned this in her remarks, but really understanding whether and how platforms, ranking and recommendation algorithms are driving disinformation or making it more prominent, or if their efforts to suppress it and their ranking and recommendation is, are working. And then the second category I would say where we need a lot more transparency is around um, how much disinformation is occurring in non-English languages and whether the platforms are taking appropriate steps to address that disinformation. Because we know from whistleblower documents and elsewhere that platforms devote a disproportionate amount of their resources to English speaking content moderation. We also know that non-English speakers are targeted by disinformation, including in the US, um, Spanish speakers and speakers of other languages in the US, but also around the world. There are elections around the world happening and these platforms operate in languages, uh, global languages. So we need to know whether or not they're doing an adequate job addressing disinformation in other languages too. So there needs to be a lot more transparency. That's a great segue to talking about policy. So we've talked about actions in the private sector. But in the past few years, a number of policymakers around the world, even outside of the EU's DSA or proposed US legislation, have um, policymakers have proposed various measures and frameworks to combat the spread of harmful or false information beyond researcher access to data or ad transparency. But even though there is, are plenty of examples that show that false information is harmful, some of the proposed solutions have still been very controversial. So I'd like to hear your perspectives on a fundamental level. What is the role of government or what should the role of government be in combating disinformation, especially given some of the tension that we mentioned earlier between free expression and political speech versus content moderation or free expression and harassment? Yeah, some of the policies are terrible. I, I mean, there's no there's no good way to there's no nice way to say that really. I mean, I, I see um, preliminary policies sometimes where I'm like, I don't think this is constitutional. You know, <laughs> I'm sorry, like I you know I'm not a lawyer, but um, I'm pretty sure that government shouldn't be weighing in on how many times something can be retweeted or not before the retweet button is disabled. Um, that's the sort of thing that what government could do in that case would be to pass the Platform Accountability and Transparency Act, enabling researchers to perform that independent assessment, enabling then reports and, you know, kind of public communication to explain and articulate the value or the, you know, the reason why some feature design might be uh, bad, use a very simple, you know, oversimplified term. Um, this is not the sort of thing that government is, I think, equipped to weigh on at all, in large part because the feature sets change so quickly, the algorithms change so quickly, and so you have a, a situation in which 
um, you know, regrettably, Congress is 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 subject to some of the same kind of polarization and hyperpartisanship. And so you have arguments arguing that social media is bad without any kind of agreement on why that is or what should happen. And largely it's because of where they see their relative standing uh, on what social media is amplifying, which is counterproductive. And so I don't think we've seen very much good regulation at this point. And so, you know, the, unfortunately, this has left us with, um, you know, the European Union to regulate and and other countries to kind of weigh in at the margins. And, you know, I think that it's it's not necessarily a, a bad thing. It's just disappointing that American government can't get its stuff together to pass policies about an industry that is, you know, the kind of foundationally American. And I, I see that as, as something that's been a, an immense source of frustration over the last seven years. Yeah, you know, I, I agree with a lot of that sentiment. I think that when we do see um, a lot of the new laws and regulations, especially outside of the U.S. context, um, they tend to do much more harm than good. Um, you know, since 2016, there have been more than 69 countries that have introduced new laws designed to limit the spread of mis and disinformation online, new what um, are often called fake news laws. Um, but often these laws are are then used uh, in digital authoritarian contexts to prosecute um, individuals, journalists, activists, um, and to really like clamp down on freedom of the press and freedom of speech by maybe fining people for sharing this kind of content to um, jailing them for a certain amount of time. Um, there is a report that just recently came out um, that has shown that, you know, arrests due to fake news laws have been increasing over time. Um, and so these kinds of things, I think, can have really chilling effects on free speech and on democracy worldwide. Um, and so I think I'm very hesitant when it comes to any kind of regulation that involves content because I think it's the wrong problem. I think we need to be looking at some of these deeper questions about platforms, their incentives, their business models around transparency and accountability um, rather than trying to create rules about the content. There's lots of rules already in the legal books about rumors, defamation, um, things that can deal with the content when necessary um, and let the courts kind of handle it from there, I don't think we need new laws in that in that regard. Rather, we need to think more creatively about why these disinformation goes viral in the first place, and then create regulations to create protections there. Uh, I would just add that I agree with Samantha. We should be extremely skeptical of laws that would um, criminalize or outlaw disinformation that they can be very dangerous and i am a lawyer so i'll say i think they would be unconstitutional in the united states as well um, at the same time another trend we've been tracking in the us is that we've actually been seeing laws passed that would prohibit platforms from engaging in content moderation and removing disinformation particularly when it comes to politicians and political speech. So the social media law that was passed in Florida um, recently has a provision in it that would prohibit platforms from permanently banning political candidates or suspending them for more than 14 days and also would prohibit them from using automated tools to um, promote or downrank posts that are even just about candidates, whether or not they are from the candidate or not. And so that type of law um, really would impact social media companies' ability to respond to disinformation because, as we discussed earlier, unfortunately, sometimes disinformation is being spread by candidates themselves, and that can be the most influential and damaging kind of disinformation. Um, that law has been preliminarily held likely unconstitutional, uh, and so the, the provision is not in effect currently. Uh, there may be a cert petition to the U.S. Supreme Court that will finally resolve the constitutionality of the law if the court grants cert, but it's extremely concerning to see legislatures kind of going even in the opposite direction to try to prohibit platforms from uh, engaging in their First Amendment right to decide what kind of content they want to host and not host and to remove disinformation where they see it. I will say that, you know, it's not all doom and gloom in terms of what governments can do, though, I do think there are some policies that can be used to combat disinformation that are not incompatible with free expression. So governments can do a lot to promote media literacy among the population and also to be a source of accurate and authoritative information about elections. And so doing things like 
teaching voters how do you actually spot and debunk, uh, and debunk misinformation, holding a town hall or a Q&A ahead of an election to tell people, okay, here's the real information about how you participate in our upcoming election, where you can vote, how you can vote. Um, taking advantage of social media where they can and getting verified so users know this is a, a real government source of information. I can trust what I'm seeing uh, from this source. Those are all things that governments can do that are totally compatible with free expression rights, but can also um, be a way to kind of try to combat disinformation and stop it from spreading. So a few um, audience members have asked about the disinformation governance board. And I'd like to start by saying we live in a very polarized America. The Disinformation Governance Board at DHS was recently disbanded after public backlash, just as some background. Even though the board did not have any operational capacity to physically remove online content, there was some public confusion about the purpose of the board, among other things. So my question is, Given a relatively low level of trust in government institutions among some communities, is it possible to establish some kind of wide scale public acceptance or perceived legitimacy over any government sponsored efforts to promote civics or promote trustworthy information, even something like you mentioned, Caitlin, um, just putting reliable information related to elections out there? So one, oh, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, Renee. I was just going to point to one example that I think maybe was more successful, which is CISA, the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Agency's rumor control website that they started in 2020, where they actually debunked disinformation in real time uh, related to elections. It was political. It did get them in political hot water, but um, they, you know, have continued to maintain the site and say that they continue will continue it in the future. And it's also being replicated at the state level as well with some state secretaries of state um, also starting their own rumor control sites where they can debunk disinformation in real time. And I think involvement at the state level and at even the local level is very important because while there is distrust in our democratic institutions and government in the US, I think the more local you get, the more people see it as, um, as representative, as, as people they know, as an institution they know and is and can be kind of an unbiased source of information yeah i think we have a couple things um happening here i agree with caitlin i think that state and local is um there's higher levels of trust and yet even there what we see unfortunately in the context of elections is uh, harassment of local election officials as well right and so there's a challenge which is that um i think resisting the temptation to not do anything because there's a recognition, and I think it was alluded to a little bit earlier, that unfortunately harassment can be used very effectively um, by influential figures who have a particular hyperpartisan agenda. And there is a that intersection where disinformation and harassment come into play is often in this area. Um, one of the things that we've been very interested in at SIO is this question of the multi-stakeholder model. And so um, we are very curious about, you know, we've looked at it in the context of elections, we've looked at it in the context of health misinformation. Are there ways to create um, kind of public-private collaborations, not even partnerships, they're not funded by, uh, by government, but, uh, well, I'm sorry, I should take that back. Uh, NSF is in fact government, so we do take government funding in this, in this regard. Um, but there is this, uh, this dynamic where we say that the, in order to facilitate counter speech, in order to have an informed public, there are times when the person with the greatest understanding of a particular dynamic around the execution of an election is the state or local election official. Similarly, in the context of public health, it might be the public health official who really understands the dynamics of how a disease is moving through a community. And so you want that information to make it out to the public. But at the same time, this idea of like a top down communication strategy in which the governance board or some other entity, um, you know, serves as the arbiter of of, um, of information, uh, speaking to all audiences that are equally re equally receptive, that is a past media environment that does not exist in the in the present state of affairs. And so the question is, is there a way to um, to create a collaboration whereby those state and local officials can reach out and communicate with civil society organizations and say, hey, this is what we're seeing. This is, you know, our, to our best guess at this moment, the facts on the ground, here is what your communities need to understand. 
Um, and that way, the messenger, the, sorry, the message, sorry, the messenger is not necessarily the political actor, but possibly a messenger that is far more trusted by the community so that there's more receptivity uh, in, you know, in, in who is receiving the, the message and, and in what context and at what, in what time. Um, so this is an area where we've really moved from using the framing of mis and disinformation. You know, we, we don't think that's really accurate as far as like the actual manifestation of what happens online. When I said rumors and propaganda, I think that particularly in the context of elections and things, uh, oftentimes that is what's happening. We see people, Sharpie Gate was brought up as an example. We see real people trying to figure out what has happened with their ballot in that moment, reading and receiving these rumors from, you know, viral rumors that are spreading online and then trying to make sense of, well, the, you know, my secretary of state website says this, the people on the internet say this, what should I think? And that's where I think this opportunity to, um, not have the messenger necessarily be the federal government, but to have that message, that the kind of messenger messages um, capacity be distributed among a whole range of different types of communicators um, who can speak with um, authority, but also resonance for the audiences that need to understand, uh, you know, the accurate facts on the ground at that time. Oh, oops, I was on mute. Um, I think we have time for a couple of audience questions. So the next one is, how do we ensure that platforms such as YouTube or Twitter enforce terms of service violations? And this is something that has come up both in the conversation surrounding content moderation and antitrust legislation. Well, I think the only check we have possibly here is uh, transparency. <laughs> and uh, there's a limited amount of transparency right now. So uh, the platforms that were mentioned and others publish transparency reports where they talk about the uh, amount of content they've taken action on with respect to their various uh, policies under their terms of service. Unfortunately, a lot of times those reports are lacking in context. So you don't get a full understanding of um, the overall picture of how much content was up in the first place. So if it says, you know, we removed 10,000 posts as being disinformation, well, you don't know if that is, you know, 1% of all the posts that were disinformation or 99% of all the posts containing disinformation. So those transparency reports provide some data to the public, but um, not necessarily enough to fully assess whether platforms are enforcing their terms of service. So I would come back to, again, the greater access for independent researchers to um, get access to that data that could provide the context and allow them to assess um, are platforms doing a good job enforcing their terms of service or are they kind of letting violations slip through the cracks either purposely or by accident? That has to be done in a very careful way. It can't, it can't necessarily just be made totally public because there are real legitimate concerns around things like trade secrets and more importantly, user privacy. And so there does need to be some mechanism to ensure that the data is being uh, handled properly and given to independent researchers who are who have the expertise to do the research and uh, protect user privacy along the way. But I think transparency is really the, the true check we have on platform power. And, and the only check, it's a difficult one, it's not easy, but it, it is the only way to go about it, I think. Yeah, I agree. And I just wanted to add to, um, especially when we're thinking about platforms operating in a global context, having like breakdowns by country in terms of these transparency reports, like we don't know um, even like that kind of breakdown as to like how much by a lot of content is removed in X country versus Y country, or if, um, you know, how many users engaged in an overall narrative that were like real people versus the disinformation campaign. Um, so just providing more information in these reports, I think would be really, really useful to building up public trust, but also giving researchers some of that access and insight to really measure impact. Um, and then, you know, I also wanted to say there, and just to kind of complement what Caitlin was saying, there is a very kind of fine balance in terms of what gets made publicly available versus what is kept kind of secret, um, especially when it comes to identifying disinformation campaigns and the various kind of coordinated inauthentic behavior, because if bad actors know how platforms are identifying their accounts, they can easily change their behavior to a 
avoid detection. And so there is a very fine balance and trade-off when it comes to providing access to information that disinformation researchers would find useful versus keeping it um, a little bit more secretive um, so that we can, you know, continue to detect bad actors um, and also ensuring privacy and, and safeguarding, you know, user rights and all of that. The next question is, we've talked about the role of governments and tech platforms in countering disinformation, but is there a role for internet users as well? For those of us in the audience who use Twitter or TikTok or otherwise consume news online, is there anything that individual people can do to prevent the dissemination of false or harmful content? I think it's hard because it is something where um, at scale it's a, it's a challenge, but people really do have a lot of, um, a lot of power here, I would say, in the context of um, just the kind of think before you share guidance, right? You know, a lot of times people will share something just because it's unflattering towards a particular politician or political party that they don't like. And so um, they're not interested in whether it's true or false. It's more like sharing as signaling, which is how rumors have worked again for centuries. Um, it's sort of a human nature kind of component just exacerbated by the dynamics of the internet. Um, I do think that, you know, I see interesting opportunities, particularly when members of a community um, kind of fact check or correct influencers of their own community. So it's not read as like somebody from the opposite political group is is challenging my point of view. It's more like, hey, I don't think this is accurate information. Here's something else that I know about it. Um, and I, I do think that sort of uh, intra group um, correction, when I see it, I, I I always kind of read the thread under it to see how people react. And I think that that is possibly a, um, one way that people can engage in, in constructive conversation on Twitter uh, around disputed context. I do think there's also this um, bird watch is another thing that I've been really interested in where people actually kind of like sign up to go write the fact check for Twitter basically just to kind of say, hey, I know something about this, this tweet is wrong. Um, and that dynamic of, of um, kind of community generated response is also really interesting because it, um, it, it's, then the fact check doesn't look like it's coming from some kind of elite organization on high, but rather it's a, a community, um, community involvement, community kind of shaping their understanding of, of what is actually happening. And, and I like that model too. I like that model as well. Um, sometimes, you know, I think about um, the the harms too, um, where, you know, governments um, or the trolls who are posting disinformation might just simply shift to these community based systems in order to get the fact checks and the narratives that they want out there, um, especially thinking about this in like more of a global context where we have, you know, troll armies that are hired and paid by the government to infiltrate these kinds of communities to push various narratives. Um, you know, I, I so sometimes I'm a little skeptical of all community based systems. I think there need to be certain kinds of checks and balances to make sure that the people who are participating are actually, you know, real people, representative people um, have some kind of knowledge or status on the, the topic that's being discussed um, or come from some kind of like journalist or fact checking community. Um, I think a lot of the work that a lot of the fact checking organizations really do in this space um, and how they kind of collaborate with platforms is really, really interesting and um, a really positive step forward. Um, I also am a little skeptical sometimes of the wisdom of the crowds, um, especially if we're going back to identity-based propaganda, because again, it's those ideas of racism, of sexism, a lot of these commonly held beliefs that people have intentionally or unintentionally um, that shape their own kind of worldview. And those biases can make their way into these decision-making processes um, in various ways. And so, you know, I think, community should of course be at the center, but we need to also recognize the inherent biases that people carry when they're evaluating the factfulness of information. Thank you so much, Samantha. That's a great note to end on. And thank you so much to everybody who submitted additional questions. Unfortunately, we are at time, so we'll have to wrap up, but please keep an eye out for additional events and projects at CSIS on this topic.
I'd also like to thank my CSAS production team, Stefan Welsh, Georgia Wood, and Chloe McGill for making this event possible. And to our speakers, Caitlin, Samantha, Renee, and Suzanne, thank you for joining us and for your important work in this space. This is an evolving area, and I look forward to continuing the conversation with all of you soon. Thank you.